So, Paul, what do you think of this icon? Is it orthodox? It's very naturalistic. There's just absolutely nothing iconographic about it, other than the fact that it's a saint that the Orthodox Church recognizes. So people like to say, well, where in the, can where in the canons does it say you can't do that? Well, there's a lot of things in sacred tradition that are not written in the canons, but they're handed down to us from the ancient iconographers, for example. We have certain specific colors and we have certain specific shapes, whether it's Byzantine iconography or Greek iconography of some sort or Russian iconography of some sort, as to how faces are painted, clothes are painted, colors are chosen, etc. And if you notice in icons, even when there aren't any Orthodox Christians, like the martyrdom that happened in Esfeg Menu by the, by the Latins, everything is an iconographic form. Even non-saints, those who murdered the monks in Esfeg Menu, and that icon that I was referring to, they are not saints, they are not Orthodox, but they are painted in iconographic form. So the dragon needs to be painted in iconographic form. The horse, the saint, the spear, everything must be done in iconographic form because it is a complete icon, not a partially iconographic, but must be painted fully iconographic. Iconography is a sacred art. It is beyond art. It is the art of arts. It is a correlation, a connection between God and his saints, between God and man. And we make a contact to God, to his saints, to the Theotokas, to the angels, uh, through iconography, there is a real connection because the Holy Spirit works through the iconographer, moves the iconographer, spiritually guides the iconographer. Our part in acquiring that connection between the Holy Spirit, God, and the iconographer, prayer is prayer and fasting. And there is a, the spiritual connection also includes that if we grow spiritually, it is reflected in the icon. Our sins are reflective in the icons. The further we are from God or the closer we are to God is reflective in the icons. If there's a disconnect between us and God, there's a disconnect between us and the saints. It doesn't mean that the, God, that the saints leave us, it's just waiting for us to come back, to return. But in the meantime, because of our perhaps deterioration in faith, we lose the ability to paint icons as they should be. No, not everyone can be an iconographer. A lot of people think anybody can be an iconographer. That's why they set up iconography workshops. As is said in the um, Seventh Ecumenical Council, Excommunicated persons cannot paint icons. Secular art, as we all know, some of it is landscapes and bowls of fruit and portraits. Secular art is also Italian Renaissance religious art. The painting of the West, where you have Christ and Mother Mary and uh, perhaps some saints, but they're painted in human form, almost like portraits. There's no iconographic appearance. There's no spiritual effect. People are moved. Fosius Kanaglu said once that there are two different kinds of movement, inner movement. There's emotional, that you go when you go see a play or you go to the theater or you listen to classical music, it moves you emotionally. 
Then there's spiritual music, uh, movement that you get when you pray, when you go to church. And the hymns and the chanting and the words move us spiritually to draw us closer to God. Western religious art is very naturalistic and you can be creative with it. Now, there's nothing wrong with secular art in itself, but it's not meant for the church. Even if it are, are, are images of Christ or the mother of God or have you, Byzantine art is spiritual. There is a connection again through the human person and divinity, even the, the presence of God within the saints. When we reverence icons, we, our reverence passes through the icon. We kiss the icon, kiss the feet, we kiss the hands, we do our bows, we do prostrations. The saint receives that. He feels that kiss. They receive it. It's a mystery. When they, they call the icon a window into heaven, it's also a window to earth because the saints literally watch us through the icon. You say, secular art, like statues, for example, they don't have that. They're three-dimensional and they are mimics of the natural person, how they, those people lived in the natural life. Our saints that we paint in iconographic form are images of what the saints look like. So some icons, some iconographers paint these generic icons that they all look the same. If you take look, if you take a good look at them, they all the images all look the same. Change the hair around, change the garb, the clothing, you know. Uh, the, the one could be St. Catherine, the other one could be St. Barbara. Switch them around, this is St. Barbara, that's St. Catherine. Uh, I see a lot of that. So we have to paint the icons as, they, as those people lived on earth. But when we put that, f that form, how they looked into icons, then they become metamorphosized and that's where the iconography aspect of them come in. They still look like what they looked like on earth, but they have been transformed. It, it shows their growth on earth in the faith. The sins that they fought are reflective in the piety that shines through them in the iconographic form. We have an icon that is flat versus the statue that is three-dimensional. And the three-dimensional is a depiction of the human form as these people were on earth. This is a typical Roman Catholic statue. It's very naturalistic. And if you, you look at the shape of the eyes, look at the shape of the nose, the mouth, the, the hair of the beard. And although there aren't much details of the clothing, there's enough to see that all these features are done realistically. May not be the best example, but everything is done naturalistically. Naturalistically meaning how we looked in life, how the saint, how the persons looked in real life. There is nothing unworldly, there's nothing ascetical, there's no piety, there's no struggle, there's no ascetical value to these statues. We are supposed to be practicing our faith and the saints are supposed to be examples of the faith that we are supposed to live. And there, with these images of statues of saints, there's, you see no struggle, you see no effort for their sanctity. With Orthodox iconography, it's nothing but asceticism because we focus on the inward man, not on the outward man. These people, the Roman Catholics, are trying to replicate simply a duplicate and statuesque form of the saints that they venerate. Well, we, of course, want to recognize the saints. So there is the natural aspect that only goes so far in iconography, enough to show that they are humans. They look human. They have their distinct characters, characteristics, but 
we take those characteristics and we see how even in this life, in the earthly life, that between man and God, there is a transformation. And it is reflective in the icon on the outward man, whereas the inward man in Roman Catholic statues is simply stifled. And there is no spirituality. There's no transformation in the statue. In iconography, it's flat because although, although they were real people, they are transformed and we don't know what that transformation exactly is. So we do not see beyond the beginning. We do not see beyond the front. We do not see beyond what that saint truly looks like in the other world. There are some people that I've also known that cannot break away from their secular artistry. They have a very, they want to, they want to paint icons, but they have a very difficult time readapting to a different form of art. They are so in, 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 entranced with their secular art. They're just so habitually connected to it. They've done it for so long and they can be very good. And, but yet they, somehow that habit has just built up in them so deeply over the years that they just, as much as they want to, they can't break away from it. And this icon, this is Byzantine style. There's, there's Greek iconography and you have Byzantine, you have Macedonian, you have several other, few other um, styles in Greek iconography. This is Byzantine. What's, what makes this a, a, an icon is if we look at the face, the colors, the color of the face is uh, golden, bronze, the geometric shapes in the clothing, the um, iconographic is difficult to explain. When you look at an icon, you, know, you notice an icon right away because it's the shapes of the body, the shape of the hand, the shape of the nose, the lips, the eyes. They have that traditional Orthodox Byzantine appearance. Colors and iconography. Some would disagree, but I say, I, uh, clothing and iconography are earthy. They're humble, they're sober. And we paint a dark blue background because it symbolizes the mystery beyond where the saint has gone. And since it's dark, oftentimes I can't tell whether that's black or that's blue because it's so dark. But that's the mystery because you can't see it. It's black. That represents the mystery, the unknown. This is a gold background with gold leaf, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's traditional and it represents the glory that shines through the saints. God's glory that comes through the saints. How come there's no emotion in the faith, there's no smiling, um, for example. Well, for one thing, it's not a portrait. This is not a, a human portrait of a earthly human being. This is a earthly human being indeed, but they didn't end up being an earthly human being. They are in another world, they are otherworldly. There's no expression on the face because we're trying to express the passionlessness of the saint, how he overcame or she overcame her passions. Now, the saints aren't sinless. They don't overcome all their passions. But the representation is to demonstrate that they have struggled over and overcome many of their sins, many of their passions. They took control of their bodies versus their bodies taking control of them. And we're trying to show the victory over the passions. So there's no expression, there's no anger, there's no sadness, there's no tears, there's no laughter. This is um, probably going to be considered Russian style, but this is not Russian style, this is new style. This is the new style where they paint quote-unquote icons, and forgive me for using that term, but 
I would not consider this an icon because it is a naturalistic style. It's more of a portrait, painting a human as they appeared in real life, but using paint versus taking a picture. But this is almost photographic. And yes, it looks like St. Elizabeth, but it is not I it's not, not an icon because it is done, not done in iconographic form. And this is not Russian iconography. This is new style iconography. New style is when you take an Orthodox saint, but you paint it so naturalistically, it loses its whole identity as an icon. And the point of an icon is to transfer, to convey the spiritual goal of the viewer and the way that that goal is conveyed is through iconographic form. Uh, this is new style that uh, was created in the 20th century. It was created because a lot of people, sadly, believed that the true uh, iconographic form that came from our sacred tradition is too austere too ascetical, too threatening, too judgmental upon the viewer. So we gave them something more pleasant so they don't have to examine themselves. Iconography begs you to examine yourself, to become like the person in the icon. And that conveyance, I should say, that, that um, effort by the icon to draw the person into the more spiritual life is emulated through the image of the icon. That's why we have iconographic form. If it could be done through just painting portraits in a secular manner, then that's what the church would have chosen. But this is what the church, this, the, not this, but iconographic form is what the church has chosen. It's been revealed, I should say, to the church by the Holy Spirit. I can give you two examples. One is Leonid Uspensky's work. He wrote a good book with his, his good friend Vladimir Lasky, who were friends with Koniglu. But he did true traditional Russian Orthodox iconography. Our father Patrick Doolin in our monastery in California, he was a student of Leonid Uspensky. So if you look at his work today, meaning his Russian, icon Russian iconography done today, you look at his work, you will see a reflection of Leonid Uspensky's work in him because he was his teacher firsthand. His work is very similar and is very good. According to the Seventh Ecumenical Council, yes, they should be put in our homes, on the streets. Well, maybe not so much in a non-Orthodox uh, world or non-Orthodox country, but they should be placed everywhere in, reverence, in reverenceable places, churches, homes, everywhere that we can have a reminder that God loves us, that the saints love us, the Theotokos, the Panagia loves us, that they are ever with us. And, you know, we know that Christ, the Theotokos, and all the saints are always with us, icons or not. But what the icons do is they give us a more tangible, tangible, visible reminder. And then when we look upon them, when we're about ready to sin and we look upon them, they put a certain loving fear into our hearts. And they know that this is sin. God loathes sin and that we should loathe sin without, in us and they encourage us by seeing them. That it, it, it encourages us to not commit that sin. It gives us strength. Well, they see our icons as idols because they think that we pray to the icon as if it in itself is a God. We pray to the, the wood and the paint. 
the wood and the paint is transformed just as the bread and wine and the Eucharist is transformed from mere bread and wine to the body and blood of Christ. The icons are two natures. They are human and divine. The paint and the, and the wood becomes holy because of the image that is set upon it. And as the seventh, holy councils, uh, seventh Ecumenical Council says, once the name is put upon the icon, the name of the saint, which we do at the end, because we don't put the name of the saint in the beginning because there's no, there's no image there to connect the name with. So we put the name on the icon at the end of the painting of the icon. At that moment is when the spirit of the saint and the Holy Spirit enter into the icon. And we are not, we are not worshiping the saint. We are worshiping God's grace, God himself, that dwells within the icon, that gives the icon grace. So all glory, all veneration goes through the saint to God. It's a circle. He gives us his blessing, we give him, and he gives us, he gives us his glory and his grace, and we give veneration back to him through uh, honoring and adoring his grace and his glory and his love through the saint. The saint doesn't get the worship. God present in the saint gets the worship, gets the veneration. Icons do not need to be blessed. Also, as the Seventh Ecumenical Council said, simply by the image that is that is painted, like the cross itself. You have a cross, like the priest holds in his hand. That, because of what it is, is holy unto itself, because of what it is. The icon, because of what it is, is holy unto itself. The saint isn't, doesn't, the, the, the spirit of the saint, the Holy Spirit, doesn't become present because of anything the priest does. It is because of the Holy Spirit that works through the iconographer, that passes his grace through the saint into the image. Ooh.